That was easily one of the top five dubstep intros I've ever had. Awesome. All right, so um, we're going to do uh, open source licenses. I've got, I think, eight minutes, so uh, hang on. Um, so uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a business consultant with a law degree. Like, I, I'm not a lawyer at, at the time. Um, my background is in information security. I've got a couple engineering degrees. Uh, and I got involved with the open source licensing when I was at MakerBot. Um, I did all the IP on the Replicator 1 and the Replicator 2. So I was there uh, uh, in around 2012. Um, so it's interesting when we, when we initially conceptualize open source hardware, we start to think about licenses uh, right away if you look at the open source uh, definitions. Um, you know, we could have looked at it in normative terms, uh, but since we're drawing so heavily from uh, open source software, I think we were right there with uh, the models that we were already new and were familiar with. Um, so, you know, th these are the goals of open source hardware. Um, we hit upon copyright because uh, copyright uh, binds instantly. So as soon as you use something, you're in the realm of copyright. Um, it's, uh, it, it's like if it was a firewall, it'd be a deny, it would be a deny all, and then you allow certain traffic. So that certain traffic is, is uh, a license. Um, uh, compare that with the contract law, which requires like a meeting of the minds. You might have to actually do some uh, recordation. Uh, some some value has to trans, uh, uh, change hands. So using copyright is it's just more frictionless. You can put your license out in the world. If somebody's using your thing, they've agreed to your license. Um, so one of the big quandaries with uh, open source hardware licenses is, uh, can you copyright a physical thing like a PCB? Um, and since we still don't have an answer to this question, um, if I'm advising you, I have to be cautious. And I'd say, uh, if, if we don't know, you can't rely on that. So it's as good as a no. So if you're talking to somebody that's trying to make a business plan you know, five, 10 years out, um, they, they can't rely on uh, uh, a license that assumes that hardware is copyrightable. Uh, so basically the answer to that is uncertainty is as good as a no. Um, I mean, if we compare it to like the GPL v2, uh, it was published in 1991. It was challenged uh, as late as 2003 and 2008. Um, so that's like 16 years. Uh, and we still have uncertainty around what's, what's probably the most popular open source license out there. Um, but uh, with that said, uh, when we look at copyright approaches with hardware, it's important to look at the entire product development um, stack to see where copyright might attach. Um, and John Ackerman, who wrote the taper license, uh, uh, took this approach, and it's very helpful. So um, a quick primer on uh, the copyright issues that we're looking at. Um, first of all, uh, the Copyright Act in the US enumerates certain categories. So depending on which category you fall into, you get certain exclusive rights, uh, and, and there's a couple other uh, finicky bits. Um, so what might open source hardware fall into? Uh, literary works, which is the written word, um, and also includes uh, computer programs. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, could a PC board be a sculptural work? Um, that's a category we could look at. Uh, and then some people have looked at architectural works, and I'm going to tell you that uh, open source hardware is not a building. Um, so that's not a category that's useful to look into. Uh, the other requirement to get a copyright is there has to be some originality in what you're doing. Uh, this is a very low bar. Um, but it, it, does, it does come into play sometimes um, if, uh, if, if, it's, if you're literally just copying something else. Um, but there does have to be some human creativity, some scintilla uh, in there. Um, the fun things here are what's not eligible for copyright. So uh, facts are not copyrightable, um, and that's a really good thing. Um, if facts were copyrightable, uh, copyright law would be even worse than it is. Um, so the example that people give is that um, the expression of a fact, 
Like, uh, you know, if, if you make a haiku about cellular mitosis, that haiku would be copyrightable, but the science underneath it is, is free for everybody. Um, and then two other ways that you can fail to get a copyright is the useful article doctrine, and this is really applicable to PC boards and where we think it falls down, is that um, I, I use the example of a chair, right? You can't copyright the idea of a chair, the platonic ideal of a chair, but you could copyright the ornamental aspects of it. Um, so, so anything that's utilitarian or considered a useful article isn't eligible for copyright. Um, which brings us into the merger doctrine. So if you make it so difficult for the court to figure out like what is a chair and what is the ornamental aspects of that chair, um, the thing that you're trying to copyright might just not be eligible because your um, expressive elements have merged into the functional elements of it. Um, so these are the stages in the development process where we think that copyright might attach. Um, so I'm just going to take them down and uh, I'll give you a yay or a nay. Uh, so schematic layouts, uh, whether drawn by hand or using a drafting program, probably eligible for copyright. A, a court's going to look at it, says it looks like a picture, it gets a copyright. Um, a hardware description language uh, probably gets a copyright because the court's going to look at it, says that looks like computer code, it gets a copyright. Um, there, there's some disagreement with net lists. So um, what a netlist is, is uh, it's, I would say, a logical, uh, a reduced map of all the junctions and connections in your circuit. Um, I, I think there's a strong argument that that's a fact um, and that it would be ineligible for copyright. People have tried to analogize a netlist to the compiled object code from software. Now, compiled object code is considered copyright, um, the distinction I would make is that the netlist is on some level describing a physical layout um, and the object code is providing instructions uh, to the processor. I think those are distinguishable. Um, the, the layout, now this I think you'd have to pay a lawyer a lot of money uh, to figure this out and it's going to be very specific based on your application. Um, if this goes to litigation, you settle probably. Um, the thing here is, you know, you're going to use an automated layout program to get started with. So then you don't know if you've passed that bar of creativity, that, that scintilla of originality. Um, then you're going to, by hand, kind of tweak, tweak the layout um, to accommodate stuff like to kill RF interference um, and this and that. So while it does take some artistry to, to produce a board that works for you, you're responding to basically physical limitations. So you're not doing it for a creative or expressive purpose. You're doing it really for a utilitarian purpose. So you could even end up in the ugly situation where part of your board is eligible for copyright and part of it isn't. Um, and then if it's too complex for the court, they're going to say it's the merger doctrine and you just don't get a copyright. Um, so this is funny, so we've gone from the, the, same, the same product from netlist, not copyrightable, layout, maybe copyrightable, uh, to the Gerber files, um, which are probably copyrightable again, magically. Because um, the court's going to look at it and they're going to say, you know, these look like architectural drafting, this looks like a picture, you get a copyright on this. Um, and then the, uh, the PCB. Um, The, a, court, a court's probably going to... I think you're going to have a hard time with this one. Um, the category that would be under would be a, a sculptural work. Um, and you're only, you, you can only take the aesthetic parts of it and make them eligible for copyright. Um, so maybe if you have a funky PCB that's um, you know, a, a shape or something, you could get a copyright over just that shape. But the, the layout of the... Um, the, the components on the board probably ineligible for copyright. So the reason we're discussing this is, you know, you want to publish your stuff out into the, the community um, and you're worried that somebody is going to take it on a level where there's no copyright attached. Um, and they can do anything they want with it from that point because your license, which is based on copyright, doesn't protect it if it's in a format that's not copyrightable. 
So if somebody takes your PCB and knocks off your PCB uh, one for one, um, there's no copyright violation there. Um, I think if they take the net list and, and you know, make their own layout, uh, there's no copyright violation there. Um, I don't think the net list is the most useful way for, for somebody to, to proceed. I think they're kind of going to want your layout of your Gerber files. Um, but this is the background we're dealing with. Um, so the popular licenses out there right now are uh, Taper, CERN, and SolderPad. Um, I'd love to hear about any other licenses. They're getting traction in the community. Um, uh, what they have in common, they're GPL v2 with hardware. Um, so the clever thing that they're trying to do is uh, on the stuff that is copyrightable, um, the, the source code, the layout, diagrams and stuff, they're going to say that you're now in agreement with me because you've taken a copyright license. And one of the conditions of that license is going to uh, say that if you make a physical product, you have to uh, do certain things with the physical product, like re-release your modifications back to the public. Um, so it, it's pretty clever. They're, they're going from someplace that does have copyright to try to get their claws on, on part of it that isn't copyrightable. Um, so these, these are the only differences that like, actually matter here. Um, Taper requires a good faith effort to email your modifications. Um, they had a non-commercial flavor that they discontinued. Um, and then there's a difference between a license and agreement, which is legally consequential but boring. Um, the solder pad license is just the Apache license. So you use this if you're a commercial entity and you want to take um, public input into your pro project, but you don't want to have those copyleft handcuffs. You want to be able to close or fork uh, your project in the future. Um, now, you can, still, uh, you can still release your stuff um, out, out into the public, uh, but you're not required to. Um, the other interesting thing about uh, Apache-based licenses is that you can layer an entire other agreement on top of them, um, and it's still compatible uh, with Apache. So you can put all sorts of crazy um, uh, requirements on that and, and still uh, be using this license. All right, so what license should you be using today? Um, uh, probably not CC. Uh, CC was just never designed for, for software. Um, the GPL would be fine for any uh, code that you're running. Uh, and then if you're choosing between uh, solder pad, if you've got a commercial project where you need some additional uh, requirements, uh, that's a good option. And between Taper and CERN, um, I'm going to recommend you just go with whatever is getting more community traction. Uh, they're almost identical licenses. So that's my time. Thanks. <laughs>